Welcome to Talking Heads on USA Global TV, starring the one and only wonderful Dr. Jacqueline. It's a prestigious place where world-class influencers and experts meet, and where you'll find the most trusted advisors and coaches for all things in life and business. Visit usaglobaltv.com to sign up for our newsletter, get the value you need, and be first in line to learn about events and giveaways and other valuable content. Connect with us. Email Dr. Jacqueline at usaglobaltv.com to talk about how you can become part of USA Global TV. That's USA Global TV, where the doctor is always in. And happy Thanksgiving to all of those out there who celebrate. There's so much to be grateful for. I personally am grateful for each and every one of you for following us across the world. It is USA Global TV and Radio, and I am Dr. Jacqueline Kerbeck, the President, Founder, and Chief Listening Officer here at our network. Our show today is Hot Topic, and I just love this graphic because it just reminds me of being free and liberated and being able to express ourselves. And today, our hot topic is going to be brought to us by a New York Times best-selling author, Tosca Lee. She has quite an interesting backstory, and she is very open to having you reach out to her. Any questions you might have about writing or about the work that she's been doing, let's welcome her to the show. She's joining us from Nebraska. Hello. Hi. Hi, Dr. Jacqueline. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for being here. I'm so impressed with your background. You have had many ups and downs in your life. You've had many iterations of your life. And yet here you are, New York Times bestselling author, which is so coveted. It's like people reach and they never quite get there. It's (laughs) it's like, how did she do it? So let's kind of dive right in. Let's talk about your work as an author and then go backwards if that's okay. Sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. So from what I read, you started out writing, but you weren't immediately accepted with open arms. There was some rejection. Tell us about that. So I never actually uh, thought about writing as a thing when I was younger. I really wanted to be a ballerina as a young person. So that was the goal of my young life until I had an injury as a, as a teen that really set me back. And, um, uh, that's the point when I thought, okay, I'm going to go off to college. I'm going to look into going into business or advertising, or I don't know, at some point, one of my parents said, maybe you should become a, um, a news anchor or something like that. And I thought, oh, maybe I'll check into that. But it was my freshman year and I came home to Nebraska. I'm the only person I know who goes home to Nebraska while all my friends are going somewhere warm. Um, I, I came home to Nebraska uh, for spring break. And I was chatting with my my dad, and I was talking about how great novels are like uh, roller coasters with the twists and turns and loops. And I remember that day, I just blurted out to my dad, you know, I think I'd like to try to write a novel. And the idea was, maybe I could try to create a roller coaster that somebody else could enjoy the way that I had enjoyed um, the books of my my favorite authors. And so this was 1989, and I, my dad said something that would change my life that day. He said, okay, Tosca, I'll make you a deal. He said, uh, I will pay you what you would have made working at the bank this summer, which is what my summer job was. I had done it the summer before. I was a bank teller. I wasn't a very good one at all. Uh, I, I don't do numbers very well. I don't remember names and faces very well all things that are important if you work at a bank. And uh, my dad said, hey, um, I will pay you what you would have made working at the bank this summer. If you write your first novel, do it first full time and treat it like a job. And so I seized that opportunity and I said, absolutely, I would love to do that. And so that summer, um, I I wrote my first novel. It was was bad. (laughs) I had no idea that in one summer, forgotten. I was supposed to go away the first part of the summer and study economics overseas. Another math thing I'm not great at. Um, and two months was probably not enough time to write my epic, sweeping, historical novel about the Neolithic people of Stonehenge. 
But um, because I didn't know that that was probably not enough time, I did it because nobody told me I couldn't. And so I wrote my first novel and that was the summer of 1989. I tried to get it published. I sent it off to New York agents and I got soundly rejected. I will never forget I sent it off to uh, Writer's House, which is one of the premier uh, New York agencies. Um, and the the letter, I rediscovered it um, a couple of years ago, and it was mortifying. Um, the poor soul that had had to read my uh, my manuscript uh, wrote back and said, "You know, your plot lacks tension. Your characters are two dimensional. However, uh, it is strangely reminiscent of Clan of the Cave." of all time and so that was enough for me to be encouraged and to keep going and so that was 1989 I wrote my second novel um, for many years during the 90s never quite finished it eventually started writing what would become my um, my first published novel at the at the end of the 90s and wrote it very quickly in six weeks and I remember thinking this is it uh, the angels have sung and this is meant to be and uh, sent it off to uh, agents and publishers and all that stuff again and got rejected uh, systematically. Um, it wasn't until 2006 that an editor, a new editor at a publishing house that had already rejected me once before, uh, said, you know what, I love it. Uh, I want to take it. What else have you got? And so I signed a three book deal at that time. And my first novel, which uh, was Demon and Memoir, uh, which is not a memoir, it's a novel, came out uh, the following year. So after all those years, um, it was a long road, but uh, the first one came out then, and I've had 11 since, and number 12 comes out May of next year. So, Wow, what an <laughs> incredible story. And that was a long period of time. How did you mentally spiritually keep yourself going saying, you know what, I know I'm really talented. I know I have something to share, even though I'm getting rejections. What did you do? Was it what your father instilled in you? You know, I think part of it was that part of it too, was I had grown up um, as a, a dancer and a pianist and, and, you know, the dancing was very important to me. And I, I, I really think I took a lot away from that life. The, the ballet world is one where, um, you know, you never quite achieve perfection. You always try. Um, I learned that discipline at a young age. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, I love stories. I love stories, whether it's it's told on the stage as a ballet dancer, whether it's, it's told through music, I was a pianist, um, whether it's told on the screen story. And so um, I think that, kind of sustained me and this idea of, well, you know, nobody said, you know, if you get rejected, you're not going to die, right? So you just keep trying. I mean, the worst thing that can happen is somebody can say no yet again. Um, I didn't know for sure if I was any good at it or not, but um, I continued to learn along the way and um, I kept trying. And I think that's the key. I mean, not just for writing, but for anything that you're passionate about, anything you want to try to do in your life, you know, just keep trying. And so um, I loved it. I loved write. I I love writing. And um, if you love it, just keep trying. And and that's at the end of the day. That's that's all I did. <laughs> and sometimes I think it's a matter of timing when the the universe. It's like this is this is the right time. So mm -hmm. you've been classically trained as a ballerina and as a pianist. Mm -hmm. You're very well educated. And you also had success in pageantry, and and <laughs> and that's a whole other area of uh, whole other. We have a whole different show on about that. What can you share with our viewers and listeners on that? Okay, well, you know, I never grew up doing pageants, and that was that was a mysterious world that other people were a part of, and I was not a part of. Um, and, you know, had I had I known more about it, maybe I would have investigated it when I was younger. But what happened is I was in my late 20s. I was married for the first time. And I uh, it was a friend of my mother who said, you know, why don't you run for Mrs. Nebraska? And I remember thinking, first of all, uh, that's a really odd thing to think about doing. 
Um, but also I remember thinking, huh, why not? And so I, I thought, well, I'll look into it. And, um, you know, it, it was a whole different world from anything I was used to. Uh, you, you do an interview with a bunch of judges, half the pageant. This is the married one. So it's a little different uh, from the, the Miss pageants. Um, your, your talent as a, a married woman is, is being a, 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 a wife, a mother, a career person, all those things. And so interview is very important. And, but of course, then you've got to walk on the stage in a, a swimsuit and an evening gown. And so at the end of the day, it's, um, if you walk away with the title, which is what I call it, because with that title and with that platform, you're able to um, draw attention to, to great, uh, great organizations and charities throughout the state. Um, I spent the entire year uh, as Mrs. Nebraska um, highlighting, you know, the, the work and um, raising money for uh, juvenile diabetes and, and breast cancer awareness and, and prevention and um, and uh, the American Lung Association and different things like that. So, um, yeah, but it was definitely, I, I had never done that before. And so when I went off to the national pageant, I remember getting there and feeling completely cowed. There I was in Las Vegas with, you know, three, four, five suitcases of clothing and stuff like that. Um, but I made some lifelong friendships there and met some incredible women. And uh, when it was done, it was like, okay, great. I've, I've done that. I can check that box off in my life. I will tell you though, um, one thing I learned, I worked with a, a pageant coach who uh, is not probably what you might imagine. He didn't teach me how to walk or anything like that. He, he worked with me on my interview. And some of the, one of the things is, um, you know, we're all aware that we're being judged at any moment, but we're not concerned about the judgments being placed upon us. And that's something that, that has served me very well in my life as a, a novelist, as someone who is especially on social media and so you know it was a kind of a weird chapter in my my past but it was one that has um, taught me many lessons and served me very well thanks so much for sharing that and, and i mm -hmm. love the fact that you have this openness and this curiosity to put yourself <laughs> out there and try different things because that's that really is how we learn and i also mm -hmm. feel that opportunities present themselves at a certain time in our life and if we don't take advantage of them then that's really missed but um, mm -hmm. from what i've learned from interviewing other people who've been in pageants there is something that you really take away in addition to that community that you have with others but it's that sense of presence and that self-esteem mm -hmm. that you can get on a stage and you can command respect and you can share your story. And so mm -hmm. you also have a, a lot of experience in corporate at major organizations that people would know of. Um, what can you tell us about your learning experience there? Fine said, you know, you might be really good at this. And I thought, I'll give it a try. Um, so I worked for uh, many years as a consultant for the Gallup organization. Um, the Gallup organization is best known for its polls, um, but in fact, it also does a lot of work in the areas of employee engagement, customer engagement um, with uh, Fortune 500 companies and uh, uh, global uh, corporations. Um, so it was a, a great chapter in my life, um, getting to work with managers getting to to coach uh, uh, leaders and and meet with them and and to do this throughout the world um, it was a great opportunity to travel and see the world meet many different people um, also it really informed my um, the Gallup organization uh, some some of you may be familiar with the strength finder which is a Gallup product and uh, based on over 50 years of research. And so it really informed my approach to doing things that we're good at and acting along the, the grain of who we are as opposed to against it. Um, and, and, you know, working with our strengths as opposed to spending time focusing on our weak weaknesses, um, which is how many of us were raised remedially. 
uh, to work on our weaknesses rather than really invest in those areas where we are the most strong and the most naturally talented and gifted. And so that was a, a great period in my life for me to to learn about that, the power of positivity, the power of uh, positive psychology, uh, to to get to see the world and to um, have an impact on the the corporate culture of um, many large uh, companies that are everyday uh, names that we've all heard of today. So um, it was great. I, I absolutely loved it. The problem was that when it came time, when my writing career took off, it came time to make the decision, do you continue to do this this thing? Do you continue to be a consultant? Or do you take on this uh, growing writing career and, and go with that? And it was really a, kind of a frightening decision. I was a single person by then and, um, you know, uh, totally on my my own tr trying to you know make the best decision for my future and um and and I have to say one of the scariest things about making the leap to writing full time uh was giving up my health insurance <laughs> at my company so that was really scary um but you know there comes a moment there there are those forks in the road that happened to us in our lives. And that was a big one for me, where it was either go this way and really commit or go this way and, and stay the course. So I chose to go that way. Thank you so much. I totally can relate to what you're saying about healthcare. I left the corporate in 2020 and the best healthcare ever announced like, whoa, it's a different world. Nobody prepares you for that. It's scary to give that up, right? <laughs> you, mean, yes, you don't think about is. it until that time, but then you're like, wow. It's frightening, <laughs> yeah. but we keep going. We keep going. So we're so now you've you've left Gallup. You're going to focus full time on writing. Before we delve into that, which we're going to, for people out there who are doing side gigs, right? They're writing on the side and they're afraid, mm -hmm. like you just said, to jump into being a full time author. Do you have to have a, a contract in order? Like, what is the encouragement you need to know? that, okay, mm -hmm. let me jump in. Is it just the feeling you have? Is it that somebody's writing a check and saying, okay, we believe in you? What are your thoughts on this? Well, I think if you're writing, then you're a writer. So um, it, it's not a question of legitimacy, um, even though every writer I know, myself included, deals with imposter syndrome on a daily that it's it's just about if you're deciding whether to go this way or this way to leave your job or not to write I think it just comes down to some very basic things uh, can you support yourself and your your loved ones that you are responsible for um, can you make it work uh, how long can you make it work for do you have a backup plan do you have some savings do you have you know do you have a contract in place do you so I think it just comes down to practical items like that for me it was it was a question of taking a, a, a new contract uh, that would have supported me or uh, not taking it. Um, it's just I could not give my energy both places fully at the same time. So I either had to be a consultant or I had to be a writer, but I, I, I got to the point where I could not do both effectively anymore. So that was kind of what caused the fork in the road for me. So. I think it just comes down to some practical uh, things like that. It's always helpful if you have the support of people who believe in you. Um, if you have uh, other people who can help support you financially as well, that, that makes the decision a little easier as well. So, um, but it's, it's a practical matter. Um, and even with the practicality of it, even with the economics of it, there always does come a time where it's, it's time to jump or not. And it's always a little scary, but as you said, I think that you have a, a feeling in your heart that maybe this is the right way to go. And um, you know what? Maybe maybe this is not the right decision for the rest of your life, but maybe it's the right decision for right now. I like that a lot. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And so, of mm -hmm. course, it's 2022 and 2010, you start writing full time and now you're going to have your 12th novel and mm -hmm. you become a New York Times bestselling author. In <laughs> what year? 2010? 2011? It was around 2011 ish in there. Yeah, around That's 2011. That's quite an accomplishment. So. <laughs> <laughs> right after just making that decision. So 
um, you know, it, it paid off in that case. Yeah. <laughs> so for, for people who are out there and, and they, you know, they see New York Times bestselling author, what does that mean exactly? What do you have <laughs> to do to achieve that status? Yeah, so it is kind of a coveted thing in the writing world. But, you know, at the end of the day, it just means that you sold enough books or you had enough pre-orders to sell enough books your, you know, opening week after your, your book released or at some point in the life of your book um, that you hit the list and, and the list is determined. It, it's kind of mysterious. There's lots of articles about it. Um, the list is determined, of course, by sales and the popularity of your book, that kind of thing. Um, is it the end all be all? No, but, but is it really great to have after your name? Of course. I mean, it's, it's, it's a really nice thing to have. And I'll never forget how it, how I found out about it. I've hit the list a few times. I've been fortunate enough, but the very first time I was on a plane, and I was getting ready to uh, to turn my phone off because you, you remember if you're on a plane, you have to turn your electronics off, all that stuff. Um, and a friend of mine texted me with a picture of the New York Times list that had just come out and there I was on it. And And then I had to turn my phone off. So it's not like I could call a bunch of people or anything like that. And so I turned my phone off, the plane takes off and I turned to the lady next to me and I said, um, I just hit the New York Times bestseller list. And when we get into the year, I'm going to have a glass of wine. Would you like one? And that's how I celebrated. Oh, my goodness. That's incredible. <laughs> so nobody reaches out to you to tell you this. I mean, nobody from New York Times sends an email or contacts you or your agent or anything to let you know. Well, your publisher will eventually or your agent might hear from your publisher. The publishers keep an eye on that. But um but I, I had a friend who was watching it closely on my behalf. And so she beat them all. <laughs> <laughs> That's so exciting. So how, if at all, did your life change after that? You know, um, you're given a little more clout as an author. Uh, I had been teaching writing and speaking about writing. Um, that's something I do. Uh, it's, it's a big part of my life as an author is teaching as well. Uh, it's something I, I did for the Gallup organization and something I did before I used to also teach. Uh, I used to teach a at a junior college. So uh, teaching is something I've always enjoyed. And I, I think it just gives you a little more credibility as a teacher. List and, you know, all that stuff. So. Um, but otherwise, in practical ways, you know, you sell some more books, you make a little more money. But, um you know, at the end of the day, the next book is the next book and it starts from scratch, just like every other project. It's just like every other book anyone's ever written. So you're always starting over from zero. And, um, you know, so it's every every book is a fresh new book and it's a fresh new day. Doing the starting from scratch all over again. Thank you, Toskin. For people who are really interested in reading your books, how would you describe the evolution from book one to book 12? Is there Are there synergies across all of them or are they all completely different? Books were um, biblical in nature. I wrote a lot of biblical fiction. Um, I wrote a book about Eve as in Adam and Eve. I wrote a book about Judas Iscariot. Um, one about the Queen of Sheba, and uh, after the the Sheba book, which is uh, called The Legend of Sheba, I made a, a turn into thrillers, and so I've got a book called The Progeny, and the sequel is is called Firstborn, and then also The Line Between, which came out in 2019, and its sequel, A Single Light, which also came out in 2019, and that duology happened to be a pandemic duology. And so it was very strange having this uh, pandemic uh, book and a sequel come out right before uh, I got the biblical stuff and then the thrillers. The book that's coming out in uh, next year in 2023 is a World War II book that I've written with my friend Marcus Brotherton. And this is a um, kind of a departure for me. It's a it's a, a World War II story. And it's the story of three best friends who enlist uh, and are serving in the Philippines when Pearl Harbor is bombed, which launches the Philippines uh, directly into the war. And they become part of the 
uh, the terrible chapter in history that's known as the Batan Death March and become uh, prisoners of war for um, for several years. And so um, it's a story of resilience and hope and friendship and love. And um, so that comes out next year. So a little bit different there. Uh, historical again, but a little different. Congratulations, that's really exciting. And Thank you. what kind of uh, research, what time time commitment did you have to make? For mm -hmm. this? That's a great question. Research is a huge part of my job. Um, obviously, if I'm if I'm writing about Judas Iscariot in the first century um, Israel and writing about this this chapter um, in church history and religious history, and the the commitment was huge. And so for that book especially, I, I researched for 18 months straight full time, treating it like a job, just like my dad taught me very early on. Uh, and so that, that was a, probably one of the biggest research commitments. The World War II story uh, that takes place in the Philippines was a, you know, there, there's research there too. It's a little more readily available than, than when you're writing about something 2000 or even 3000 years ago in the case of the Queen of Sheba. Um, that, but, you know, that brings its own set of challenges because, you know, it is more recent. People do remember that part of history. You have to get it right. Um, well, you have to always get it right anyway, but, um, people actually remember, uh, different details about that time period. So it brings its own set of pressures with it. Um, but I find the research fascinating and it's really funny because when I grew up, I never really thought that I liked history. I always thought that this is like a mothball type subject and kind of boring or whatever. But whenever I research for a book, I, I just find it fascinating. And, and I actually will not um, outline a book until I've done the research. So even in the case of The Progeny, which is a current day thriller, and a lot of it is set in Europe, um, I went over to Europe and I walked the streets in uh, Croatia and in Hungary and different places to set my book. And I didn't even delve into trying to craft the story or outline it until I had done that because so much of my story was informed by the places I went and things that I saw and the uh, various places I visited. So research is not only vitally important, but it, it's one of the joys, I would say, of this job. And, and I try to share that with my readers. And so that is the reason that I've, I've got a Pinterest board for every one of my books. And so I, in the case of the progeny, for instance, I share um, actual locations and things in the book so readers can follow along or see the actual places. Um, and so um, I, I think that's really fun. It's why I, I also on occasion will teach a course, uh, for instance, about the Queen of Sheba, what we know about her, things like that. I do that through our local university. It's just a chance to actually utilize some of the research that may or may not have made it into the book, but you still have to do it all the same. So really fun. It's fascinating how you've continued to evolve and to grow mm. and then mm. to take everything that you're learning and share it with others. And my understanding is in addition to all the mentoring and, and the writing and the teaching that you do that you also are a podcaster, is that correct? I, I'm, I'm not a podcaster in that I don't have my own, but I'm on podcasts quite a lot. So um, I'm fortunate enough to be able to join people and get to talk about all different kinds of things. It may not be writing, it may just be living, it may be, uh, well, you know, uh, in 2016, I, I married my, my husband and I live on a farm and I was a city girl before that and I was single and, and I suddenly became a mother to four and married a single father and I'm a farm wife now. So it may not be just about writing. It may be about farm life or the funny things that happen here. It's, I call it the funny farm. There's always something funny happening, especially when you come from a city setting and um you know there's always something interesting or funny happening whether it's a neighbor's so, there's always something to talk about it may not always be writing which is its own thing but um you know farm living is, is there's a lot of stories to tell for sure <laughs> is there a book coming a forthcoming book about farming <laughs> It's funny because I've been asked, I've been asked to write a story about how I met my husband and all this stuff. And, uh, you know, it, it could happen. You never know. 
Well, first of all, thanks to your husband, because I know farming is very difficult, and yet we depend so much on the farmers, and and it's not an easy life from what I've read. So thanks to you and your husband and to everybody there who is uh, keeping the farm going and feeding us. Yes. Thank you. Yes. They are feeding the world. That's for sure. Uh, are there certain crops that you, you all specialize in? So uh, he grows corn and soybeans, which goes into, you know, so many different products. The corn can be used as feed, but it can also be used as high fructose corn syrup, which is in, a product in a lot of our, our foods. Um, the soybeans, lots of things can happen with those. So um, those, I would say, are probably the main crops that are, are produced here in Nebraska. Um, and also, you know, some of it's used as feed for Costco chickens. You know, we all like our Costco rotisserie chickens, the five, six dollars, maybe, maybe now. I don't know how much they are now. So the chickens that we buy at Costco. So, um, you know, they're feeding everything from the chickens that we, we buy at Costco to uh, to humans. So and, and it's, it's a fun life. It, it definitely is. We don't have animals. That's a whole different thing. Um, but it's definitely a, a very interesting and cyclical lifestyle. And it's one that I, I appreciate and understand. Or getting together would really understand each other as far as their careers go. But we really do because we, we have our quiet times and we have our busy go times. Uh, when he's harvesting, it's like deadline time for him. And I understand that very well. And we're, we're both very good at uh, taking care of each other and feeding each other and making lunch and things like that for each other when it's our busy time. So, um, yeah, we, we actually understand each other very well that way. That's beautiful. And I've always <laughs> been fascinated with technology and farming, which is a whole other thing we'll oh. talk about some other time. <laughs> but, mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so much of that. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. it's amazing. I, I come from New Jersey and there are a ton of farms in New Jersey and you see all these these huge pieces of equipment. It's like, what is that? Oh, it's yeah. it's it's amazing. And there's computers so. in all of it. I mean, there's computer screens everywhere in the farming you know world these days. So yeah, very, very big on technology. Yeah, that's a whole other show that we could have. So I'm, ca I'm yeah. counting like five, <laughs> six, seven shows that we could have after this. <laughs> but getting back to uh, to the writing. So in, in your work as a teacher and also as a mentor, are there some common themes that come up over and over again with mm -hmm. people when it comes to writing? Maybe it's writer's block or you mentioned imposter syndrome or fear or, or maybe not knowing how to hone in on a topic or develop characters. For sure. Um, I'd say the, the biggest thing uh, that is across the board, whatever genre you're writing in, uh, wherever you are in your career, whether you're starting out or whether you're several novels in or many novels in, um, that imposter syndrome, but also it just boils down to fear. And writers are dealing with fear on a regular basis. And, and that's not unusual. We deal with fear um, in ev every career, any, any career we do. But there's something about writing uh, where you're, you're combating fear on a, a regular uh, daily basis and sometimes an hourly basis. And that's the reason why when I, when I go and teach, one of my, 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 my first rule of writing that I, I always tell people is to write as though no one will ever read it. And that seems counterintuitive, especially if you are hoping to get your work published. But the reason I say that is because it, it takes away this uh, performance anxiety. It takes away worrying what people will think about what you're doing. And um, I always say, you know, write as though you're you're writing in your secret favorite notebook with a flashlight in your closet at night. You're writing your your good secret stuff. You're getting your your good authentic writing in there. You're not worrying about what your parents, your neighbor, or whoever else is going to think about it. Um, and I always tell people too that if you are not published yet, that you should you should really take advantage of that time in your life because you're in a very protected space. You're not out on Amazon getting ranked next to a blender. You are writing in a, you know, you can be as authentic and as, um, and as, as brave and audacious as you want to be um, because you're not worried about all that stuff yet. So take advantage of that time and, um, you know, Soar with your bad self and and write your your good stuff. So that's what I that's what I tell people. 
That's great direction. That that gives people the encouragement and the empowerment to get themselves out there and and stop mm -hmm. coming up with excuses about, you know, we see images of people, I'll do it next year, I'll do it next No, do it now. <laughs> get it out there. Right. Now. Yeah, exactly. it takes the pressure off. Yeah. Yeah, and something else <laughs> I just want to to mention is that everybody doesn't have to be a full-time author, right? They can they can yeah. write in their spare time and whatever it is, it everyone has their own their own goal, their own mission. So absolutely. And in fact, many famous writers have written on the commute to, to work. They took a train into the city or whatever it was. I believe that's how John Gresham started. Um, he was taking the train into the city to, to work. Um, I have friends who do that. They write on their commute and it's just that, you know, hour or less than an hour, but you know, you put that much time in every day and you can produce you can produce books and good ones. So, yeah, it doesn't Absolutely. have to be full time. Mm -hmm. And Tosca, when you are writing with this new book coming out in 2023, are you writing to achieve a certain certain um, awards, continuing with uh, New York Times bestseller? What is the goal? Is it the reader? Mm -hmm. Is it something new? Tell us. My first goal is always to entertain. That's why people pick up novels, they pick up novels to be transported and to even, you know, to, to, to be transported away from our daily hassles or our daily woes or whatever it is, whether you're, um, you know, just in a stressful lifetime or you're taking care of ailing parents, or you're going through a divorce, whatever it is, we read to escape. Even if we're on vacation, and we're, we're living our best life. We're still reading to escape. And so my first goal is always to offer that escape and that portal to somewhere else where that a reader can go and en enjoy an adventure from the safety of their favorite reading chair, or their beach chair, or whatever it is. Secondly, I also, um, I write to educate as well. So whether it's a chapter in history that um, they may know something about, but maybe I can offer some new insights or um, whether it's a part of the world that they've never explored before and they'd like to run through those streets virtually in the pages of a novel. I also write to educate, but um, let's face it, you know, if we were all reading just to learn, we'd be reading nonfiction. So the first goal is always to entertain, always to capture attention, always to keep the reader reading past bedtime, calling into work, you know, the next day or whatever. Anytime I get an email from somebody who said I called into school or work or whatever sick because I stayed up too late. Um, I don't want to encourage that, but I also secretly high five myself whenever that happens. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> I love it. Tosca, I want to share your website right now so that people know how to reach out to you and they can actually have a visual of your book. So if you would, I'm going over here now, if you can just walk me through where to go. Yeah. So this is uh, my website. This is my most recent book. This is uh, Single Light. It's the sequel to The Line Between. And so if you go up to the books tab, you'll see all of my books there the upcoming books as well. And then also some fun things that you can get as well. I've got some t-shirts and other writing type stuff. And I've got a cool candle that goes with the progeny books that smells so good. And so uh, the books are there. The Lost Stories, that's a little um, short story that goes with the progeny books. And then these are my, um, all my, wow, it looks like a lot when you go like that. Yeah, I, I love the covers <laughs> by the way. Uh, thank you. I can't take any credit for those because uh, artists who know what they're doing do that. But um, so those are the Beautiful. books. And then down there's other stuff as well that goes with the, the different titles and, and stuff like so that. So I think what's really cool about what you've done is that you've you've branched out to have a business in addition to mm -hmm. the books. There's like a, a whole series of ways people can connect with you. Mm hmm. I think that's important because, you know, you read a book and if it resonates with you or you enjoy it, you, you might want to reach out to the author. By the way, I always appreciate whenever a reader writes to me, especially because I have written to other authors to tell them how much their books meant to me. And you know what? It was nerve wracking. I was nervous. I mean, it, it made, I was like, you know, my heart was beating. So anytime someone reaches out to me, I really appreciate it because I understand that it can be a little nerve wracking to do that. I love uh, connecting with readers. One of the one of the um, uh, the the 
weird blessings that came out of the pandemic is that while we were all stuck at home, um, I was able to spend time connecting uh, on a nightly basis for over two months. Um, I did this every single night with my readers and I read to, to them on Facebook live, um, spent time with them. I don't know if they tuned in for me or my dog who is more popular than me, but we, we had good times together. Um, so I really love connecting with readers and knowing more about their lives. And then uh, the other merchandise on my, my site just kind of goes to support the stories because, you know, when you enter a story world and you love it and you have a great time, um, sometimes you want to take a piece of that with you. So we have some fun items that go with those, the books as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I just love how authentic and down to earth and real you are. You're, you're a real person <laughs> that people can really connect with and relate to. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Anywhere yeah. else on the website that you want me to go? Well, you know what? The books are there. Um, I keep my calendar there. There's not much on it now. It's kind of cleared out for the end of the year. Every now and then I blog, but I'm not very um, disciplined um, about that. So there's not a lot of blogs there, but the contact is really important. So if people want to reach out to me, they can reach out to me there. Book clubs sometimes contact me and they'll say, hey, you know, we're reading one of your books. Would you join us? Um, in person if they're nearby or on Zoom. And I love doing that because let's face it, you know, book clubs are the beating heart of, of a writer's livelihood. And um, I have four kids who all want shoes. So, you know, <laughs> so anytime somebody wants me to join them, because um, they have the best snacks. So love to do that. Um, but yeah, on the website, um, we are soon about to do uh, the cover reveal for the World War II book, and we've got a great pre-order offer that will be happening. And so that's why that um, the newsletter part at the very top there where people can sign up to join my newsletter is really important because um, I've got a huge I've got a, oh, I wrote a short story recently, short meaning 40 pages because I don't do short very well, I guess, but um, that's coming out in an, an anthology uh, in March. So I'm kind of excited about that. Um, that was a whole different thing. That's really terrifying, writing short stories. It's very scary. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to say, to. I love your website, by the way. It's very powerful. It draws you in. <laughs> oh, good. Thank you. Well, I can't take any credit for that either. I, I've got some talented designer type people who do that, but yeah. But you've got the right team. That's that's what it really matters. You've got the that's right team. That's something I try to do is I really try to surround myself with people who are more talented at those things than me. And um, thank goodness for them. So, <laughs> <laughs> Well, you're doing a great job. And I'd love to have you come back and read to us. We would love to have oh, that. That would be fabulous. I would, too. I would absolutely adore that. Fantastic. Well, I'm going to spotlight you again. Of course, we've been showing your contact information, but for people who are listening on a radio station or on a podcast platform, what is the best way for people to connect with you, to purchase your books, to reach out? Well, to purchase my books, you can go any anywhere to your favorite um, independent bookstore, your local bookstore. You can go online. You can go to the, the usual suspects like Amazon. Um, you, can, you can get signed books at my website. Um, if you want to connect with me, you can go to my website and you'll see the buttons to find me on social media. I'm active on Instagram and Facebook and all those places. So you most recently last night I was cooking, uh, I was uh, posting my cooking fails for Thanksgiving. So, you know, you can see that. Uh, life at the funny farm. Uh, it's not just about writing. Actually, I don't post about writing a whole lot. It's mostly just about life at the Funny Farm. So um, I invite you to, to come join me on social media where um, we're always having fun. Excellent. Well, thank you again. And I do hope you will come back and visit with us and read. And, and also we've got other shows that are about different topics. You have so much to offer to, to people across the world. So I thank you mm -hmm. for taking the time, especially on Thanksgiving. And I Absolutely. wish you a beautiful day. And uh, thank, thank you, you for and sharing. To you too. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thanks for having me. And, and it's a, a beautiful Thanksgiving day. So very grateful to be here. Thank you. As am I. Look forward to seeing you again. Take care. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Okay, thanks to each and every one of you. Please do reach out to Tosca Lee. She has an incredible story, as you've just heard. And she's a real person, and she cares. She just mentioned about how she was reading over on Facebook Lives, connecting with people who are following her and just sharing her stories. She's got so much expertise in so many different areas, and I love that about her. It's about being curious, about embracing life, and about seeing what else is out there. Do connect. That's what we're all about here on this platform. People are coming and sharing their expertise. You've got her contact information. Go over to her website. Reach out to her. Get her books. Let her know what your thoughts are. You don't know where it's going to go. All right. Thank you again for being here on this beautiful Thanksgiving day. We are going to be pausing for a couple of hours so I can go get exercise. Yay. And then we'll be back this afternoon with the film and music show. If you'd like to be a guest on any of our shows, please go over to our website. It is is usaglobaltv.com. Book your session. If you'd like to have your opportunity to be on television, maybe you want to be a co-host or a host or a panelist, do reach out to us. We are finalizing our 2023 calendar. We've got a couple of opportunities left. Go over to usaglobaltv.com slash contact us. Thank you again for being here. We'll see you again. Happy Thanksgiving. 